You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 9. In this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, we're talking waterfowl shotguns and what you should consider when you're looking to buy one. And then we're going to be joined by Tim Schloss of Tim Schloss Taxidermy to talk waterfowl taxidermy and what you can do to make sure you get the best mount possible. Welcome to the show. This is episode nine of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We've got a great show lined up for you this week. We're going to be talking hunting shotguns and what you should consider when you're looking to buy a shotgun and whether you should go new versus used. So we're going to get into that and talk a little bit about some things that uh, maybe will help you out in your next uh, buying decision. And then we're going to be joined by Tim Schloss of Tim Schloss Taxidermy. He's going to come on the show and just talk about taxidermy in general with us and sort of share some some things that you should look for when you're considering a taxidermist. And, uh, you know, really important, he's going to talk to us about what you got to do with your bird after you've made the harvest until you get it to the taxidermist and how you can, um, you know, preserve it to make sure you get the best possible trophy. Uh, joining me in all of those discussions here today is going to be my co-host, Dan Harushka, also known as Danimal Harushka. Danimal, how are you? Hey, I've been waiting for that plug for quite a while now. Oh, and on a side note, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I figured I'd hold off a little while. I didn't want to scare off any of the new listeners um you know this only being our ninth episode but i i honestly i just couldn't hold off any longer it's a it's a nickname that i i think i can take credit for for coining you with i'm not sure completely but i think i had a piece of it yeah that was uh, back back in legion baseball Uh, yeah back to our high school baseball days so that's when it started yeah very very (laughs) we go back a long way so um you know hopefully i don't uh refer to you as danimal down the road and if anyone hadn't listened to this episode, they'll have no idea what they're, what I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, Dan, um, you know we've uh, we're going to talk about hunting shotguns on this episode, and you and I have had some experiences with shotguns in the field and issues, and you know our, our fair share of problems. So I think that uh, as we have this discussion, we have some legitimate insight that we can provide to uh, to our listeners for things that they should consider uh, when looking to make that purchase. Right. And, you know, I, when we started talking about this, I was just thinking, you know, when some people are always going to buy new and some people are always going to buy used. So, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit about both, but um, I was thinking about car buying, actually, and I've never bought a, a new vehicle and I've always had used and it's always worked. And, you know, there's some people that just absolutely won't do that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a good conversation. And, and as far as the used side, you know, just like looking for a new vehicle on a car lot, you're always looking for something. So, you know, we can give a couple pointers and, and hopefully it'll help someone out. Yeah. And there's no, there's no right or wrong or good or bad or anything like that. I mean, I think that there's just some, some sort of, you know, thought process more than anything that needs to go into the purchase of a hunting shotgun and, you know, making sure that you get what you're looking for and what's going to be useful for you in the field, whether it be new or used. Um, so we'll touch on some of that stuff in here in just a minute. But before we get into that, I wanted to actually share a, a good, um, hunting shotgun uh, story with our audience and, uh, you know, something that I've went through recently. I, um, I hunt with a Beretta A300 Outlander. It's a three inch chamber, um, you know, waterfowl shotgun. It's, came out new with from Beretta and I think it was 2012 I want to say was the first year that they had it and I bought it in late uh, 2012 in December time frame I think it was a Christmas present type of deal but you know it's it's a it's their entry level auto loader you know I wasn't in a position where I wanted to spend 12 or 1500 dollars on a on a higher end model so I bought their base model and I bought it in the the real tree uh, you know max 4 camo or uh, max 5 camo or whatever it is and um you know, I'd been really happy with the gun. And this year when I started shooting early season with it, I was having an issue with the fore end. And, um, there's a, there's tabs on that piece that sit up against the receiver. And I'm not going to get too much into the, the details of it. Cause I think it'd just be difficult to describe, um, without seeing pictures and things. But anyway, the fore end was not functioning properly and how I was having issues when I was firing the gun. So I called Beretta up after our early, uh, four day split here in Virginia. And, you know, my, my expectation was, 
I was going to have to ship the gun in and it was going to be four, six weeks and our season comes back in in mid November. And I was worried that I wouldn't have that particular gun to use and you know, all of that sort of things going through my mind. So I call them up and uh, explained to them what was happening. And, you know, they had me kind of strip the gun down on the phone and, you know, I told them and what I was looking at and that kind of thing. And without, without me pressing them, without me sort of hemming and hawing or making any kind of issue, they offered to send me a, a brand new four, a four end, no cost to me, priority shipped. I had it in two days. Um, the fit and finish on the new, the new four end is awesome. It's got a, uh, a upgraded feature to it. So I think essentially what the problem was, was perhaps my O four end and the original models was a, a design flaw. So, um, the one that I've got now, uh, is going to work perfectly. It's going to fix the issue. And uh, I couldn't be more happy about my experience with Beretta. So, you know, I'm not here to say that Beretta is the best, the only shotgun you should consider and that kind of stuff. But, you know, with my personal experience, I'm incredibly happy with their customer service. They treated me as if I had bought a $1,500 or a $2,500 shotgun from them. Um, you know, it didn't matter that my gun was only, you know, $720 or whatever it was. Um, so I felt really, really good about my experience. And, you know, with that, based on that alone, you can guarantee that, um, you know, when I'm in the market for another shotgun for my son or, you know, another one for me or what have you, um, I'm definitely going to be considering the Berettas again. So just a good, just a good experience with their customer service. And I want to, you know, make sure I give credit where credit is due. So I know Dan, you've had some pretty good experiences with, uh, with waterfowl, you know, shotgun manufacturers as well in the past. Yeah. And the one, uh, um, my mom actually bought me a shotgun and it was a Stoger. It was the M2000 model, same three inch chamber. And after about a year, I, there's a pin that was bent inside it. And I actually took it to a gunsmith, uh, around here. And, you know, he tried to, he tried to fabricate one and just couldn't get it right. So he ended up, uh, calling them and they, they said, you know, can you ship it back to us? And I had no idea this was going on. And, I think I probably had that gun for three years, I'm thinking. So, you know, there's definitely no warranty on it. And uh, the guy, he ended up calling me back and he said, hey, you know, did you have any sentimental value with that shotgun? And I was like, oh, not really. You know, um, I liked it, but, you know, it definitely had some issues with it. So he's like, well, they just sent the box back and there's the brand new model, which was quite a bit expensive, or more expensive. It's the M3000 model. So, I mean, a brand new gun after three, three and a half years of ownership, I didn't shoot it for probably two years. And, um, yeah, I mean, Stoger, you know, props to them too. There's pretty much no questions asked with it. Um, you know, they, they knew that there was a problem with that specific model and, and they fixed it. So, you know, Stoger, you know, thumbs up to them as well. That's, that's not, that's not the gun I knew used for waterfowl now, but you know, that's definitely a, a great experience. And I think, you know, contacting companies, they want to make you happy. They want to make, you know, they want to make more sales in the future and, you know, they sent a brand new gun. So, I mean, that was props to them for sure. Yeah. And I think that that's a good transition into our, our shotgun discussion here because you know, a company's reputation and the way that they stand behind their products and their warranty coverage is, is important because, you know, things can and will go wrong, you know, and nothing's perfect. And, you know, there's always a, an opportunity for things to go bad. And when they do, it's nice to have a company that stands behind their product and understands that if they want to not only keep your business, but earn your business in the future, um, you know, they need to, they need to do right by you. So having, having the experiences that we've had, um, has certainly been a positive experience. And, and one reason why I tend to lean towards a new gun versus a used gun when I'm making the purchase. Now, having said that, I don't buy guns that often, you know, hunting type guns, that kind of thing. So being that I only do it rarely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a, uh, you know, a fun experience to go with the newer models and stuff. If I was buying more guns regularly, I would probably look to save a little more money and go and go used. Um, I mean, currently I own two hunting shotguns. I own my Beretta and then I own an 870 pump that was given to me by my dad when I was 12 um, and I used that up until, you know, 2012 and, and still will take that occasionally turkey hunting, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm the type of guy that when I buy a gun, that gun's mine forever and it's, uh, going to be passed on to my family and, you know, my kids and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, buying something that's, that's dependable and it's going to last and it's going to stand 
behind it, you know, the company's going to stand behind it's important. Um, for this discussion today, we're going to stick to hunting shotguns, you know, the standard style. Um, you know, we're not really so much going to go into double barrels, over unders, upland bird you know, guns, that kind of stuff. You know, for our for our general discussion, we're going to stick in the standard lane here. And I think the first thing to probably consider, um, you know, once you figure out your price and your budget, that kind of thing, is whether you want to go pump or auto. And, um, you know, for me, I knew that when I was looking at my Beretta auto was what I wanted to do. Um, I was, I had the pump, I wanted to go auto. So my, my decision was even broke down a little bit further versus gas and inertia operating systems. But before we get into that, let's talk pump versus auto, Dan, what, um, you know, where do you lean as far as that type of uh, breakdown? If you're, if you're looking to buy a shotgun. It's a tough question. I, I shoot a auto loader now and I think I always will, but, um, I think I have a little bit different background than you on as far as the, the used gun. Um, my dad and I, we probably go to three, two or three gun shows a year. And I think I, it's safe to say that he has a buying problem and it's getting to the point where my gun safe is getting full with his guns. So, um, we definitely do, you know, a lot of looking around at guns and, yeah, um, I don't really see I don't really see a problem with that. You know, for you. <laughs> uh, I guess, I guess if he's a hoarder, he can't, he can't have any better problem than, than stocking up on guns. But, um, back to your question, um, I really enjoy shooting a pump, but as far as waterfowl, I I think I'm a an auto loader for life. So here here's where I stand on this. Um, I think absolutely both have their merit, and I think that both can be as effective as the other. So here's what I mean by that. So when you shoot a pump gun, you you fire the shot, you rack another round into the chamber. That that momentary pause for me forces me to get my cheek back down on the stock, get a good sight picture and make another good shot. I found myself with my auto loader that I will pull the trigger quicker than I should at times and not get a great sight picture or not get my head bared down on the sight enough just because I can shoot it so fast and I feel the birds getting away from me and it just sort of creates that anxiety to, to get the shots off as quick as possible. So although it is a nice benefit to be able to follow up quickly with the auto loader, you know, I do think that for accuracy at times, there is a benefit to, to being on the pump gun. Yeah. And I have a, I was going to say, I have a, I have just a, a small tip. If you, if you're switching back and forth from an auto loader to a pump, one good thing to do, if you are going to take a pump out, shoot a couple clays before you go out. Cause if you've shot an auto loader for a year or two, and then you're going back to a pump gun, I've done it numerous times where I go out, I take that first shot and then I just keep pulling the trigger and I can't figure out why my gun's not shooting. And then I'm like, oh, right, I need to pump. So um, just, a, just a small tip, something to keep you fresh before you go out with a pump. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I tend to try to stick with the same gun in season if I can. Um, I, I'll take the pump a little bit with me in uh, turkey season for a couple different reasons. And, and I'll talk to you about you know that in a little bit. But um Let's talk a little bit more about auto, break that down a little bit more. So, you know, you shoot uh, Beretta, I shoot Beretta. Both of those guns are gas operated. You know, the Stoger you mentioned, Benelli's, guns of that nature are inertia driven. So for anybody listening that's not familiar with what that means is basically the uh, when the round is, is uh, uh, you know, fired, the gas pressure from the explosion inside the barrel is channeled to basically cycle the round from the magazine into the barrel inertia is the recoil of the gun um you know pulls back into the spring that's located in the buttstock of the of the gun and it cycles the you know works the action through the recoil of the gun so um, by nature a recoil will be slightly heavier on an inertia driven gun simply because it needs to be to, to work the action versus a gas now a gas is going to be more more dirty uh, depending on the type of rounds you shoot may require more cleaning going to be more carbon on the parts and that kind of stuff. But for me, um, I've, I've said it a couple times on this show. I, I don't care for recoil. Um, I think the harder the recoil is part of the reason why I don't like three and a half inch shells, the harder the recoil, the longer it is for me to get back, get back a good sight picture and make an accurate follow-up shot. So I wanted light recoil 
And uh, for me, that was a no-brainer for gas. The drawback to that, and I've heard some people try to say that, you know, and a gas gun can freeze up on you in cold weather. Um, you proved that it certainly can happen um, on your gun. But in fairness, um, you know, that gun no, hadn't, that was, been, that was hadn't nothing been to do with gas. That was nothing to right. do with the gas. It was straight carbon buildup and my lack of cleaning and... I I will keep it at that. I will I will own up to that one. Also, it was negative eight degrees the entire hunt that we were out there, and I have learned from that. And now, pretty much after every hunt, I have a, a clean gun. So I think that's good practice anyway. Yeah, and I I'll, all I know is my my Beretta didn't lock up that day, so uh, we'll leave it at that. But anyway, uh, so that's sort of the differences between gas and inertia. Um, six one way, half the dozen the other. Um, you know, some people want to say that an inertia driven gun doesn't cycle as well on lighter loads. Yeah, I don't know if there's any um any truth or merit to that or not. I think all guns need to be broken in properly, follow the manufacturer's specs. If you do that, your gun should perform uh as it's supposed to. So, you know, just some things to consider. I've already touched on this, but three inch versus three and a half inch chamber. You know, we we talked about this in a previous episode that, you know, we both shoot the three inch chambers for our reasons. Um if you want to go three and a half, by all means, more power to you. Just know that you're going to pay a little bit more for a three and a half inch chambered gun versus a three inch gun. Um, what do you think, Dan? Do you think you'll ever uh, buy a three and a half inch chamber? I don't think so. You know, Federal did a very intensive survey there and, and the research was pretty intense. So, you know, the there weren't that many more pellets in a 30 inch circle and like like we said before, I I just don't want the pounding on my shoulder if you're having you know a multi day hunt or just a bang out hunt. So I don't I don't want that. I don't want to take the pounding, and I feel like I don't have to. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. Yep. And for me, the other big factor is price. You know, when you if you shoot a lot, you know you're going to spend a lot more money with you know going through a a box or a case of shells of three and a half versus three. So. For me, price is a big thing to consider when you're looking at that. So let's talk about um, finish. You know, um, you've got your traditionalists that love the wood stock. You've got others that like the tactical look or the black synthetic look. And you got others like me that prefer the camo finish. Where do you stand there? My gun right now is the black finish. Um, like we said before, water filers are, are pretty rough on our equipment and I think I'd my next one is definitely going to be a waterfowl finish, the camo finish. Um, one thing I do say, if you're getting into waterfowling uh, and you like the wood stock and you know the shiny barrel, um, just when you're out looking at a duck spread and you're looking back at the blind, you don't want to be shining, and that's something I know. You know, a lot of people are in blinds, but if you're you know sneaking in and you don't have a, a huge pit set up or something like that, then, you know, you, you have to be concealed a little more. So that's something to think about if you are going to purchase something like that. Cause I know we were setting decoys the first day and, and I could definitely see a shining gun in there. So just, just a tip to think about. Yeah. I think, um, I think you're okay whether you go synthetic wood camo finish, you know, just as long as you're cautious. But I think most people are going to consider a black synthetic or a camo just simply because you can be a little bit tougher on it and you don't have to worry about the wood getting nicked and, um, you know, looking dated and banged up. So for me, I prefer the camo, uh, finish. I've got the black synthetic on my Remington 870 and my Beretta's got the camo finish. And I got it mainly because my black synthetic gun shows rust so quickly if you don't keep clean and, and stay on it. Um, you know, if you go a couple of weeks through the season and, and uh, you know, the rust spots will start to show up. The camo finish, that stuff's like bulletproof on the outside. You know, I hunt the Potomac River. It's brackish water, you know, you know, so it's not a true salt environment. But, I mean, there is an element of that there. So all of that can be just a little bit more hard, a little bit rougher on your on your firearm. So if I can get that little extra, you know, outer layer of cover from the camo finish, you know, I choose to do that. It's not that much more expensive. So for me in the long run, I think the camo finish is worth it. But again, um, everybody's got their own style and there's no right or wrong way to go about, about that choice. I, I uh, agree with that. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, my gun, when we show up to the field, my black, you can see every, every scratch on that, even from laying in a goose blind, you know, on a crossbar, like every time I pull up on that or, you know, jump back in the blind, you know, there's a new, a new rub mark where every time you show up, 
your gun looks brand new. So, you know, half dozen here, you know. Yep. I mean, I think it's all, you know, all your hunting style. And if you know you carry your your gun in the field with white gloves and you keep it protected and all that kind of stuff, you know, you're not going to have a problem with whatever finish you use. Uh, I'm not like that. Mine's thrown in the bottom of the canoe. It's, you know, banging around on the back of my truck. It's, you know, it's getting, it's part of the, part of the equipment out there for me. So, uh, I need something that's going to be a little more durable. Let's talk, um, use of the gun. So there's things to consider. If you're going to buy just a waterfowl specific gun, that's all you're going to use it for. That's one thing. But if you're going to use this shotgun for waterfowl hunting, turkey hunting, small game, shoot some traps, shoot some skeet, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of things you want to consider. Um, for me, the biggest one is barrel length. Uh, you know, if I'm going to waterfowl hunt, uh, I want a longer barrel, 26, 28 inches, something out on that range. If I'm hunting turkey, I certainly, you know, I would like to get a nice shorter barrel that's easier for me to maneuver in the woods and that kind of thing. Um, I tend to use my 870 for all things but waterfowl, and then I use my Beretta for for just waterfowl because it's got the longer barrel. I've got an extended choke in it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a semi-auto gas gun, so it's a little bit heavier, a little harder for me to carry in the field. Just pump guns are going to be infinitely lighter because there's less working parts involved. Um, so for me, you know, I take all of that kind of stuff into consideration before I make the purchase of a waterfowl gun. Um, what, what are the, some other things that you consider, Dan? Well, I think that's a good one. And if, if you are buying a used gun, uh, say at a gun show or something, you know, it, it speaks to experience of going out and, you know, just seeing the size of the guns and just realize that different time periods had different size barrels on it. So, you know, if, make sure you're not picking up a youth gun with a short barrel or, you know, some of those, some of those old 10 gauges, half the time you probably don't even have to shoot them because the barrels are so long. You could probably just knock birds out of the sky with it. So, I mean, that's something to to think about when you are, if you are buying used and one more thing to think about too, um, like I was saying with what you're going to use the gun for, um, consider the, uh, the gauge that you're, that you're going to use. So if you waterfowl hunt once or twice a year and you're primarily an up, up game and, you know, squirrel hunting and some turkey and stuff or, you know, things that you're, you're going to use more of like a 20 gauge type, uh, you know, uh, firearm for, I, I would just say, Look at what you plan to use the gun for, and whatever gonna you're gonna use the use it for the most, go with that gauge. So if you're gonna hunt primarily grouse and pheasant and that sort of thing, maybe you want to go with the twenty gauge, and then just plus up on the ammo a little bit when you hunt waterfowl, and make sure you're shooting birds a little bit closer, a little more ethical, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you know that you're gonna hunt squirrels maybe once or twice a year, and you're gonna primarily waterfowl and turkey hunt, get the twelve gauge, and uh, you know you can go on the two and three quarter light loads you know, when you, when you decide to do a small game hunt. So consider what you're going to use the gun for and whatever you're going to use the most go that route. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. And I think I might actually try a 20 gauge out a little more than what I have in waterfowl just to, you know, add a little excitement to it. Oh, it can definitely get it done. I've seen a lot of youth hunters use them very, very effectively. Um, I don't own a 20 gauge. If I did, I would probably, uh, I use one. I, I would really like to get a 20 gauge over under, um, you know, someday down the road, but we'll see. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, um, new versus used and just some things to consider when you're buying a new gun or a used gun versus a new gun. Um, for me, one of the biggest things is I like to know if I'm buying something used, I want to know a little bit about that gun. So I think it's a really good opportunity if you've got a friend or a you know, somebody local that you know that's selling a firearm that you can get your hands on and talk to the previous owner, you know, where they've been hunting with it, you know, are they hunting in a salt environment or not? And, you know, how rough are they on their equipment and that sort of thing? It just gives you a little bit of feel for what the gun's been through. And again, guns are incredibly durable, so they're going to take a lot, but there's certain things that, you know, you really want to check. And for me, you know, has it been exposed to a lot of salt water, that kind of thing? Those are really important when you're talking about the lifespan of the gun. Uh, what say you, Dan? Uh, I think some some of the obvious, you know, just outer outer views of a gun. You know, if you're looking at a barrel, if there's dents in it or, you know, uh, kind of like bulges, you know, some of that that 
gets into safety and and that's something you really don't want to deal with and on on the safety aspect of it the actual safety you know making sure that that works that clicks and uh you know keeps you safe in the field is is definitely top of the list yeah i think it's important to get your hands on the gun break the action you know uh make sure if it's a pump or if it's a uh, a semi-auto is it smooth does it feel good is there any kind of slop in there does it feel loose to you anything like that um you know make sure your choke tubes can be removed make sure they're not rusted in there so that you can't even get them out uh check that kind of stuff make sure the gun's got a plug in it um you know check the safety like you said all of that stuff is super important check out the outside of the gun make sure there's no you know, real significant dings or scratches and stuff you know you don't want to overpay for a used gun that you get home it's got a real big gouge in it and that kind of thing um you know so just sort of a good general look over is 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 the key to buying a used gun and the more information that you can grab on the gun the better and you know there's a lot of depending on the type of gun you're looking for there's a lot of used options out there if you don't feel like the first one that you pick up is the right fit, don't be afraid to put it down and move on, regardless of how good of a deal the guy's looking to give to you. Maybe he's going through a divorce or he needs he's hard up and he needs some cash. Um, you know, if it's not the right gun for you or a good fit, you know, don't be afraid to say no. But I want to touch on something that I think is becoming more and more prevalent. And um, it's something that I've never done personally, but I know is becoming uh, very popular. And that's buying guns online or buying them you know, from a long distance. And, um, you know, obviously the big thing there is you just want to make sure that you're in line with all the federal and state statutes and regulations, you know, go through an authorized FFL dealer. Um, I, I, I would be very, very hesitant personally to sell a gun online with, um, you know, just the world that we live in. I have no idea what that person's intentions are with that gun when they buy it. I don't want any kind of blowback on me for that reason. So, uh, for me, I don't know if I would ever consider selling a gun online, but I would I would consider buying one online if it was something that I felt was a, a good situation that I could do, um, you know, and at a reasonable price and sort of that I felt comfortable with. But where do you stand, Dan, on buying buying guns online? Um, I have I have yet to buy online. I like to you know either physically feel it or you know know someone that had it previously and that's kind of where I stand. But, um, I, you know, that's not to say I'm not on gunbroker.com all the time looking at guns, looking for deals. So I know a lot of people that do buy online and I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I'm more of the, I like to feel it, you know, especially if it is used, um, you know, just feeling, like you said before, the actions and making sure that it's just in the shape that it needs to be if I'm, if I'm going to spend money on it. Yeah, and I don't know um, if it's common practice, but I gotta believe that if I was to buy a gun online, I would try to build in some type of review period, where you know three five days after the purchase, when the gun's in my hands, I get I get a chance to look it over, make sure that I'm happy with it, fire the firearm, make sure that it's it's everything that I thought it was going to be when I made the purchase. Um, you know, I think it'd be easy to, for someone to get sort of you know uh, scammed by by a gun that has been really beaten up or just not quite the condition that you thought you were getting. So, you know, just be cautious if you, if you go the online route, not to say that it can't be done successfully and, and with a good experience, but you know, for me personally, I would just, uh, you know, make sure you cross your T's and you're dotting your I's when you're looking to buy something online. So yeah, on, uh, on that, on that too, um, just check out different prices. Like I said, you know, gunbroker.com, you can pretty much put any gun in there that you want. And I know that because my dad will call me about once, maybe twice a week and ask me what a good price on a certain gun is. And he'll throw out names that I've never heard before and they have it on there and I'll give him the lowest price and the highest price. And if it's in between, he usually picks it up. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a research nerd that way as far as going on and, and finding prices. So, um, there's a ton of information out there. If you, you know, if someone is making you an offer on a gun, if you're looking to pick something up and make sure you're not getting ripped off on that section too. Yeah, all, all good information there. Um, if you have had an opportunity to buy a gun online or you know, you've got things that you like to consider when you're purchasing a new new or used weapon, um, let us know. Shoot us an email, info at hpoutdoors.com. You can always reach us on the uh, HP Outdoors hotline, 724-609-FOWL, 
three six nine five. We love hearing from you guys and and uh, you know learning and hearing from your experiences and uh, you know buying a gun is certainly something that a lot of people can relate to and uh, um, you know can shed a lot of light on. So if you've got something that you think you can add to the discussion, feel free to uh, reach out to us and uh, we'll be more than happy to share that with everyone else listening to the show. So um, anything else, Dan, that you think is noteworthy that we should uh, discuss about buying shotguns before we move on to waterfowl taxidermy? Um, I did want to mention one thing. I I started by saying check out the outside of the gun, but do do your research on the inside of the gun as well. I mean, you know, you talk about hunting brackish water. Um, you know, check the barrel. Most of the times, if you are picking up a used gun, it's going to be clean. So you know, check it out. Make sure it's not pitted on the inside, or you know, there's any major problems. But also, you know, check the magazine tube. It most likely is going to be dirty, but if it's pitted. Um, are really, really rusty, that's something to consider. You know, it might be beautiful on the outside, but if the inside doesn't work and you're not field dressing the whole thing, there might be more problems. So, you know, just be aware of that. Yeah, especially if there's, you know, damage that you're not able to repair easily. You know, I mean, you if there's damage that needs to be repaired, that's one thing. Uh, but you need to know exactly what you're getting into as far as a financial commitment, and you need to make sure that your purchase, you know, price reflects that that commitment that you're going to make to the weapon. So um, all good points. And again, please, if you've got something that you think is uh, worthwhile, uh, you know, you can reach us on Facebook, Twitter, that kind of stuff and uh, continue the conversation there. So uh, Dan, let's, let's change gears a little bit here. And um, we're going to be joined by uh, Tim Schloss of Tim Schloss taxidermy. He's located out of Erie, Pennsylvania. And um, you know, he does some phenomenal uh, waterfowl taxidermy. We've both had the opportunity to see him at some of the shows locally there in Western PA. And, uh, he's going to come on the show and I, and we wanted to do this because pretty much every time that we've hunted that someone wants to mount a bird, um, once the bird is harvested, there's a debate or a discussion about what you should do with that bird until you get it to the taxidermist. Some people say wrap it in newspaper. Some people say put it in plastic. Some people will say put it in a, um, a nylon, you know, whatever the case might be. A lot of different information out there, a lot of different opinions, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we wanted to bring him on the show just to have that conversation and find out exactly what should we, you know, be doing with our birds in the field because there's there's nothing worse than harvesting a bird of a lifetime or, you know, a bird that has some sentimental value to you only to damage it by something that you did inappropriately or, you know, didn't take care of up front. So, uh, you know, I'm excited to chat with him. I think he's going to have a lot of good stuff to say. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to talking some waterfowl taxidermy with him. Yeah. You know, he's been in the business a long time. And like you said, uh, the stuff that he brings, the amounts that he brings to shows is they're just un they're they're not real i mean they're just unreal they're amazing so you know he knows what he's doing he has 50 some years experience and um he knows what he's talking about so i'm excited to to talk to him yeah so let's go ahead and let's get into it uh we're going to be joined on the show by tim schloss of tim schloss taxidermy All right, we are excited to be joined on the show by Tim Schloss of Tim Schloss Taxidermy, located in Erie, PA. Uh, we're excited to ask him a few questions about, you know, something that we believe is often misunderstood, and maybe there's some bad information that's circula- circulating around out there. So uh, we're going to chat with Tim here to uh, get some clarification on the process. So, uh, Tim, welcome to the show. It's uh, Josh Palm and Dan Harushka. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on. We're we're more than happy to have you on, and uh, we appreciate you giving us some time to talk about something that, you know, we think is pretty important. Obviously, uh, you know, guys put a lot of time and money and effort into getting in the field and, uh, you know, having successful hunts. And when you harvest that bird of a lifetime or you want to, you know, secure that memory for uh, for years to come, um, you know, it's an important process that, you know, probably doesn't get enough attention as it, as it should. So we're glad that you're here and we're excited to talk to you about about the process. And maybe before we get into it too much, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, the, the business that you run there and sort of, you know, how you kind of got started in waterfowl taxidermy. Uh, well, I, I basically got started the way a lot of young guys get started. I was my, in my mid teens and a gentleman in my neighborhood was a, a, a taxidermist. And, uh, uh we kind of, you know, as kind of hanging around the taxidermy shop and then, uh, I just kind of stuck with it. And then, uh, 
when he passed away, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I went to work for one of the bigger tax centers in Sanieri, Pennsylvania, and I was uh, new couple, and I was doing, you know, whatever you were told to do, you know, doing the, uh, skinning squirrels and skinning deer heads and all the other kind of stuff. But uh, the birds have always been my uh, my passion, you know, and, and it was something that uh, those guys noticed early on that I kind of had a hand at it, you know. So they really encouraged me, which was, I'm glad they did. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I've had the chance to take a look at some of your work in, uh, you know, ex- sports shows and exhibits in the in the Western PA area there. And, um, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that do taxidermy and kind of dabble in birds. And, you know, um, I think a lot of dedicated waterfowlers know how difficult it can be to work with birds and feathers and the skill sets that it, that it takes to, to be great at that craft. Um, talk to us a little bit about what a guy should be looking for. Um, you know, when considering a taxidermist to ensure that he gets a quality product, you know, are there any red flags that you, that you would say, um, you know, it's something that you should probably take as a sign to keep looking. Um, I mean, obviously a lot of guys, you know, price is a big thing for them and, you know, um, but, um, but that obviously shouldn't be the only consideration that, that people take into account. So what are some of the things that you think a good taxidermist should have, uh, going for them when, when talking to a client? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is um, it, whether you're having a, a bird monitor, a game head, or a fisher, or whatever. Um, as in a lot of things, uh, certain guys are have like specialties. You know, uh, now not to say that I, I know some uh, very good tax service that are basically very good at all aspects of it. You know, there there are guys like that, but in most cases, most guys. Uh, you know, they have a you know, strong interest in deer, and they, and they do a great deer, and uh, or they do small game or fish or, or whatever. Uh, I think with birds, and I would have to tend to agree with you, they, they're a little bit different type of thing. They're very delicate, um, and it's something that uh, there's so many different varieties. I, you know, I hate to say a whitetail is a whitetail, but a whitetail is a whitetail uh, with birds. Uh, which is one of the big reasons I got so involved in it. There's so many different kinds of waterfowl that are native to North America. And then, uh, uh, and even with the game birds, there's, a, there's just so many different ones and they all have their unique personalities and, and colors that, that you have to reproduce. And I, um, I think it's best to look, you know, I hate to say a specialist, but, uh, if it was me getting one model, I would look for a, a waterfowl or bird specialist. A lot of my clients may take their deer heads, whatever, and their game and their game stuff, but uh, they bring their birds to me. Um, so, and I, and I think that's and, and that's what, the way I would approach it. I would look for a specialist. And as for uh, red flags, I think the best thing to do is uh, is actually go to the shop or go to um, and actually see the work. You know what I mean? Uh, um, and, and, and as you said, you have to consider your prices. You know, I mean, a lot of guys will, um, you know, if you start the conversation with how much is, I mean, you, you need to know how much they are, but uh, generally you're going to pay probably a little bit more for a specialist, but you, you're probably going to get, uh, more for your money. Uh, but then again, that being said, I mean, it, it, in, it, in this economy, you know, for, for the gentleman, you know, you should, you should try to get the best that you can afford. I wouldn't go with uh, what's the cheapest. If, uh, and I think that's true in a lot of things, whether it be, you know, buying a shotgun or uh, a car or anything else. So uh, I would say just go and see the work and, and make sure that uh, uh, you're on the same page. You know, what, what you're paying for is, is what you're expecting. Yeah, I think that goes a long way with with just about anything. You're going to pay, you're going to get what you pay for. And, and you know, when you're, when you're looking for a specialist to, you know, if you're getting a bird of a lifetime and you want it to last a long time and not be, you know, having feathers falling out, you probably don't want a guy, you know, that is straight fish that also has a permit to do birds. So, I mean, I think that's. Yeah. And, and the thing is, uh, I think most guys, even, even on the, uh, and, and it's even more than just the feather fall. I think that the, the way the chemicals are made anymore today, most guys, even, a, you know, a good game guy can, um, he, he could probably put one together for you that, that is not going to fall apart. The difference between a specialist, I think, and, and someone who um, is just doing birds is is that part I mentioned about the the little subtleties that each species of bird has. 
and a guy who really studies them probably has a better chance of putting that look, or, you know, that the reproduction of the colors, you know, the, the look of the eyes and stuff like that back into it as opposed to someone who's just, you know, putting it together by the numbers of 50, you know what I mean? Yep, I know what you mean, and you know every time I see you at a an a expo and and checking out your birds, I mean you're you're definitely amazing at your craft. So let me uh, let me switch gears a little bit, Tim, and let's talk about stages of feathers and um, what what's the best time of the year for shooting a bird? I know you know they get you know different feathers coming in, and and what time really is the best to get a great looking mount? Yeah, that that's a that's a really good question, and and uh, where we live, unfortunately, and it not a, it's a great place to live, and our bird hunting is very good. Uh, but the problem is, being in such a northern climb, um, and with birds molting or even the young of the year, they don't come into full full color. Some of the species, uh, especially noticeably like blue winged teal and shovelers and stuff, they may not get full you know good color till well into December. The problem with that is they're long gone from here, <laughs> you know. Right. So being a taxidermist in Pennsylvania or Minnesota or New York or like that is a little tougher than, say, guys that are further south due to the fact that we're, we're handling birds a lot of times that really aren't totally up to color. Um, now, in my business, I have a, it's a pretty... Uh, uh, I have a I have a lot of clients that travel, so uh, they're killing ducks that are you know in in January and December, and, and you can and you'll see the difference. I mean, to use a, a illustration, uh, we we mount some you know I mount some really nice wood ducks out of Pennsylvania, some beautiful birds. But that same bird in say Georgia in January is going to be that much better. Uh, but then again, I mean, we, this is where we live, and this is what we. <laughs> This is what we shoot, so we're uh, we're, we're not that we're stuck with it, uh, but that's kind of the way it is. Now, certain species of ducks, mallards, black ducks, uh, you know, uh, cans, redheads, uh, we do shoot those late, and we do shoot some beauties. But I would say the teal, uh, pintails, stuff like that, by the time um, when they come through here, they probably really aren't up to color yet. Not to say that. You know, there are there is the exception to the rule, but generally, uh, the later in the season, the better. Um, now, the only time I've ever seen that kind of work against it is in like, uh, but with this new the uh, conservation seasons on the on the uh, snow geese and stuff, I've mounted uh, geese that were actually past prime. The feathers they almost got kind of a a broomy look. They're almost. Uh, uh, like starting to wear out, <laughs> you know, I mean, from the long flight south and the long flight black north. Uh, but uh, generally, they'll speak in uh, later season birds are better. But we have to think what we got. Yeah, and, and besides the migration, you also have to deal with, with our seasons here in PA. You know, some of our seasons go out at the end of December. So that, you know, you go to Pima Tuning or Conneaut Lake or Lake Erie and you, you're seeing all these beautiful birds and, and you don't get a shot at them. So that's another that's another thing you have against you. But um, yeah. and it, and that's but that's not, that's kind of a universal. I have uh, taxonomist friends that, that a lot of us are in the, the northern climes and uh uh, you know, we, that's just what, what we deal with. You know, I mean, they're, uh, uh, it, it makes our job a little bit harder, obviously, because, you know, the, you can, uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be repaired, you know, uh, blood on the feathers and stuff like that. They, you know, you, you have to wash them and, and degrease them and uh, that kind of thing, but uh, you can't grow feathers. I mean, that's the, that's the downside. And I, unfortunately, I do have, have the gentleman will, uh, either mail me birds or drop birds off, and and you know I I I just have to tell them, listen, you know you really don't want to do this, you know. Now if it's something they know they're never ever going to hear another one, uh, you know, or if it's like it's a kid's first duck or something like that, then you have to do what you have to do. But uh, generally, most guys appreciate that. They know that you know you can't, you know I can't make that 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 mallard that's on the front of the DU cover. Uh, you know, look like look like that with the bird that you've given me. It's a early season; half the feathers aren't even there. <laughs> you know, so that that's something you have to uh, uh, you, you, and you have to get an eye for. You know, uh, I have so I have a really good clientele that doesn't happen that much, but it does happen. 
Yeah, besides blood and and you know some feathers not quite being there yet, what are, are there any other characteristics that someone should be looking for when they, you know, when they consider taking a bird to get mounted? Well, the big thing is, I mean, yeah, there's um, there's feather like um, I, I would say feather uh, damage. I mean, yeah, they, you know, obviously they, they've all been shot, so so there is some there is some blood. Blood generally is not an issue whatsoever. Uh, the taxidermists, they have to be washed in soap and water, uh, even down to woodcock. I mean, I, I did a woodcock today. I mean, believe it or not, I wash them in soap and water. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you would think, it's going to fall apart. Well, you know, you have to be very careful with it, but it'll hold together. But they have to be washed. So the blood isn't an issue. Um, feather damage, actual um, feathers missing, uh, 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 shot through, say, the eyelids and stuff like that. I mean... Now, a, a bird that, to use an example, a bird that has maybe chipped wingtips, now it may, it, you may not want to mount it stand or flying, but it might make, make an excellent standing mount. So, you know, that's the kind of thing where if a guy brings her in, you know, he has his heart set on flying, like, well, well, you can't, I wouldn't do that with this bird, but you might want to go fly standing. Well, at that point, they either make a decision to go with that recommendation or wait and get a better one. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to kind of work around the bird. Uh, and, and obviously you want to show the, you know, that the, the strength of a bird, you know what I mean? You want, uh, um, if a bird's got a, a, a really, really great side pockets, um, and, but their half the feathers are out of there like they're wood duck. Well, wait and get a better one, you know, because you can't grow those back. Um, but, the, but generally that's the kind of thing where, uh, a lot of times you can hide flaws in birds uh, in the damage. But uh, I'd say the big thing is just look at how beat up it is. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, the, the maturity of a bird. And unfortunately, that's the kind of thing that takes a little experience. You know, if a, um, a, a novice duck hunter uh, may not be able to pick up the uh, the little subtleties that, you know, of what a good bird is as opposed to a, a, a first year bird. Uh, you know, they're really, I, I can't really give you any tips on that. That's just a matter of experience. Once you, you know, handle enough birds and all of a sudden you pick one up and say, whoa, this one's a lot nicer than that last one. You know, those are the ones you start looking for. Now, the other thing is the species thing. You know, we're living here, um, they keep canvas packs. If you live in an area, they don't kill many canvas packs. Well, when you get a canvas back, you're going to probably get him mounted whether he's spectacular or he's halfway there, you know. So sometimes you have to do, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 you get it mounted more for the uniqueness of the bird, not the quality of the bird. Right. And um, I just wanted to go off that. I was last year I, I shot, uh, actually, Josh was with me, but um, I shot a banded wood duck and it is in the freezer right now. And I was, the more pictures I look at and the pictures that I look back at the actual hunt and I'm looking at it and it's just, it just doesn't seem like it's ready. The hood just isn't a complete hood. And the more, the more I research and look, I just, I just know it's not the right time for that. So, um, that's a great point that you bring up and a little bit of research can help you out in that way. I had, I did have a more specific question, um, just about considering for a mount and is something, is any kind of beak damage, is that, um, something that is able to be fixed? Yes, because actually anymore, the way, the way that, um, the, at least the way I do it now, not, not everybody does this, but I'm going to say in, in, in waterfowl or, or in game bird taxidermy, the majority of the guys you'll find now using it, what is it? It's a cast bill. It's an artificial bill. So what they do, and, and the reason for it is, um, you know, a lot of guys say, well, it's not really my duck. Well, that's true. I mean, it's almost like the, uh, the old days when you'd see like a, a, a swordfish. Well, the only thing you really got back that was yours was the actual bill of the fish. The rest of it was a casting. And this is kind of the same situation. What we do is make it. They made castings of of a of a uh, of a uh, freshly killed duck bill. It, it, to advantage of that is there's no shrinkage. So if you look at old taxidermy that's around somewhere, if you look at the bill, it's all shriveled down like a potato chip. Well, the, the stuff that's done recently, there is none of that shrinkage. And the birds are like king eiders, common eiders that have a very fleshy bill. 
there's no shrinkage whatsoever. I mean, it's just, it's still plump. It looked alive. The, that's one advantage. The other advantage is you don't have to make an incision in the neck um, to remove the skull or to get the skull out. You actually come around basically around the edge of the bill where the feathers touch the bill and bring the bring the skull right through the front of the, basically right through the front of the face. And then you have to super glue it back on there. But you're able to paint the bill, uh, pre-paint the bill so you don't have to do any um, masking. You don't have an incision, which allows you to make more turns and things to the neck without having um, uh, lumps and bumps and stuff like that. It just makes for a much, much more realistic, lifelike mount. Uh, so actually, a shot-up bill is not any way stops you. The only time that can run into a, a problem is if, if the shot is right at the the seam between the bill and the feathers. Sometimes that can be an issue, especially in this day and age with uh, steel shot. Obviously, a lot of guys are using, you know, deuces and, and uh, BBs, and some of these um, shots they have on now actually have, they aren't perfectly round. They've actually got kind of a, uh, a different shape to them, and they, they do more damage than the old round lead did, for sure. I mean, they're definitely real old. So, um, it can be a problem if the hit is right at that edge, but the actual bill itself, that is all replaced. You know, the the shot to the eyelid is probably more of a of an issue than one to the bill. It's it's interesting because uh, you know a lot of times you you see birds with a you know a bill that's been shot up, and I know me, I kind of always considered you know never really thought that that was something that could be fixed. So you know, I'm sure there's guys that have probably passed on birds that uh, they would have liked to have mounted you know, for that. So I think that's, um, that's good information to know. Um, yeah, that was cool. But so some of the shot holes in the feet can be repaired too. I mean, if the feet are really damaged, uh, and you know, maybe you want to do something with one foot up or something, but, um, just a, a shot hole in the foot can usually be, uh, I can use a skull ball or a boxy the type of thing to, to fill that hole and actually repair it. So that, that's something repairable also. And, so I'm sure that um, obviously there's there's damage from the shot that cannot be repaired and can and can ruin the opportunity to have a great mount. But I'm sure that right. um, equally as often, or maybe not as equally as often, but I'm sure it does happen that um, a hunter will not take uh, the right steps in in, in uh, preserving that bird from the time of the harvest till he gets the bird to you to ensure that, you know, you can do what you need to do to make it uh, look as great as possible when you, uh, you know, when you start the mounting process. So this is an area that I think there's a lot of information out there. I don't know what exactly is the right way and what's the wrong way. So, you know, some guys say plastic, some guys say newspaper, some guys say da, 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 da. So let me ask you, what is the proper way to preserve a bird that you harvest in the field until it gets to you, um, and ready to mount, and what are some common mistakes that you're seeing people make? Okay, first and foremost, the one thing that I would do is is you want to get the bird into a freezer, or at least cold ASAP. I have a lot of guys that'll, they'll leave them sitting out in the back porch for two, three days, you know, and then all of a sudden they get over to the taxidermist. Well, that's fine if you tell the taxidermist that, that he knows it's been out for three or four days, but uh, the problem is if he refreezes it and then, you know, next July takes it out and it sits for 24 hours there while it's fine, well, you know, then you can start having an issue. So I'd say the number one thing is to get that bird, you know, cold, cold or frozen ASAP. And that's easy to do when you're hunting from home on a trip. You know, sometimes you don't have access to a freezer, so you might want to, you know, get it on ice and get it cool. Uh, Keep it dry and get it cool. Now, waterfowl are a lot tougher than upper game birds. I mean, you know, you can uh, be a little rougher with them and, and not and not do any real damage to them. Now, um, like grouse and pheasants, say you're on a hunt and uh, you shoot a nice pheasant or a grouse, I, I do carry nylon stockings. But I'll, this is the part here we really want to discuss because that's always been a thing that guys go put it in a nylon. Well. There's nothing wrong with putting it into a nylon stocking, put it into your game bag to get it to where you're going. But once you get it there, cut it out of that stocking. 
do not freeze that bird in the stock. Reason being is if it's not in there perfectly right and the feathers are twisted, you can cause some long-term damage. Uh, the nylon stocking is probably the worst thing in the world to store a bird in. You know what I mean? But that being said, when I'm pheasant hunting, I carry one because I when I put it into my game bag, I want it. You know, it does keep that bird from getting all ruffled up. But the minute we get back to wherever we're staying, I cut that bird out of that stocking. You know, that's been that's probably the biggest thing that uh, misconceptions. A lot of guys put them in stockings, and that's not good. Uh, the other thing is paper products. I wouldn't wrap them in newspaper, uh, paper towels. Anything like that, because what happens is that that paper actually draws the moisture out of the bird. Uh, plus, the newsprint you you could possibly uh, have some like on a buffalo head or something like that, if, and it's wet, and you put it on that newsprint. You know, the ink could transfer onto the white. You may not get that out. Yeah, I don't so think I your uh, I don't think your mount's going to look real good if you got that nice bull can with the classified section across the side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, and I and I would, like I said, that's something that I would keep it out of the paper products. Now, I do on my website. I have a page that kind of basically everything I'm telling you here. But the one thing I do know is a lot of guys. Um, the best thing to do is just to take the bird, put his head down onto his breast, so that it's not out straight, and put it into a Ziploc bag, and put it in the freezer. Now, sometimes you know, guys, they. You know, there might be some blood in the bag. You know, you know, it just doesn't look good in your freezer. So you could put a paper towel in there, uh, in the bag with the bird until it's frozen. Then once it's frozen, open the bag and get the towel out of there. Because, and another thing too is if you're getting into the taxidermist in a timely manner, say within, within, uh, uh, under a year, um, it really isn't that big of an issue, uh, on the, on the dryer. Um, but if it's going to sit for three, four years with with paper wrapped around, it is definitely going to uh, speed up that drying out process. But uh, the big, like I said, the big thing was that to get the head down onto the breast, get it into the freezer, ASAP. Now you you don't need to gut the bird. You actually do not gut the bird. You know, don't take the breast out of the bird. You know, it's either a mounter or an eater. You know, um, the other, and you don't have to put. I've had guys put cotton down the mouth, and you know, even even cotton in the vent and stuff like that, which it, it doesn't hurt anything. I mean, you're not doing any damage, but the autopsy really isn't necessary. Now, if you have a lot of blood on a bird and then you want to wipe some of that off, just use cold water. You know, wipe a little bit of it off just to put it into the bag. I mean. I have to wash them anyway, but you're not doing any damage by doing that, if, if you know what I mean. It's not that uh, you're not wrecking it by doing that. Really, basically, the only way you can really destroy one to be, be long-term in a, in a nylon stocking or the other way is the is the uh, wrapping it all up in newspaper and putting it in the freezer. That that can cause some damage. So how long, uh, how long, it, how long will a bird stay good in the, in the freezer before... Um, you know, I know you said, you know, any time within a year is, is really no, not an issue, but, you know, say, um, you know, guys trying to scrap together some cash or, you know, whatever the situation may be, I mean, how long is, is too long when you should probably, uh, you know, toss it out and, and look for the, look for another one. All right. Well, before I answer that one, I have one more point on that, on the first one. The reason I said about putting the breast, the head down on the breast, that you won't do any damage by freezing it off on straight, but you could, you know, if you were to hit it, on something, you could actually break that head right off, almost like a popsicle, you know what I mean? So that's yeah. why you say bring the head down. Okay, now, to move on to, on to the next question, a lot depends on how it's wrapped. If you have a bird, um, I've had guys, a lot of these guys actually use these shrink wrap things, you know, without really drawing it down real tight, just taking a little bit of air on them, they last a long time that way. They last great. Uh, it's frozen in a, in a Ziploc bag. I mean, three, four years, you know, three years is nothing. I mean, you know, uh, I've, I've mounted birds that have been in the freezer five years, you know, six years. Now, that being said, the best way to do it is, you know, within a year to two years. That's when it's still fine. Um, a lot of it depends on how it was wrapped and also how your freezer runs. I mean, some freezers seem to 
dry things out more than others. You know, I've had birds that have, a guy's had his fuse for two years, you take it out, and it's like, geez, it looks like it's fresh, and then you get one that's been a year, and it's already starting to show some freezer burn sides. And uh, what that generally is is the, is the way they were wrapped and maybe the freezer. You know, you definitely, I think the best way, if you get them in a Ziploc, get them in a freezer, you know, you don't see anything in two years. Three years, you might see just a hair, but it's still more than monocle. Uh, you start getting in that five, six-year range is when you start seeing some problems. But they're usually correctable. Like, well, what what, a, what a, an average taxidermist will do would be, if you can get them out of the skin, what I do is I inject it all around the face and any, like the tips of the wings with water, with soapy water, get that bird out of his skin, get him degreased, and then that will soak them in soapy water. And you can get that skin to relax right back up. And, um, you know, like, and a lot, like I said, I, but I have seen birds that are, you know, a guy will bring it to you that have been in your freezer for six, seven years and it's a piece of cardboard, <laughs> you know. So, uh, it's a lot to know you how it's wrapped. I think there's just a ton of great information there. And for our listeners out there, Tim, Tim's been doing this for over 50 years. So he has seen a lot of birds come through and, and knows what works. So just to throw that out there, not, not to date you or anything there, Tim, but, uh, just so they know that, you know, if they go to your website and see the quality of birds and what you can do, they know that they're dealing with a professional here. So, um, with that being said, your, your new website's up. There's a lot of pictures of birds on there that are just absolutely beautiful. And myself, I just look at that and I'm like, how, how does that happen? So tell us, I want to know what, what's the hardest, most difficult species to mount? Well, the, the, for me, the hardest, most difficult, common one, it's funny, it's, it's, the, it's the big and the small. Swans can be a total nightmare. <laughs> you know, they are very difficult to mount. Uh, you know, the, the head is about the size of a buffalo head. You know what I mean? They are, and, you know, uh, they are a very difficult bird to mount. On the opposite end of the spectrum is woodcock. Woodcock are just, they're very, very hard to mount for the reason being is, you know, with, with the swan, with the swan, it's strictly the size of it. There's just so much surface area. It's just so much going on. Now, Woodcock, their problem is they literally have a skin that that it's pretty much like wet tissue paper, <laughs> and when and it's it is really difficult to get them get them out of their skin. Plus, they are very fatty; they have a lot of fat on them. So, I would have to say, to me, the hardest bird to mount is a swan. But woodcock got to be right after it, you know. Now, I'm sure there's worldwide. There's tons of tons of birds that are, you know, more difficult than either one of the two I mentioned. But uh, I'm just, you know, those are the ones that we uh, get here in, in the United States. So uh, those would be the ones that I would I would say are the worst. Yeah, that that doesn't sound like much fun if it's like wet paper. That that would probably get that that get pretty frustrating. Let's. Uh, what's what's your favorite duck to mount? While we're on a topic, what's your favorite duck and and what's the most what's the most popular bird that comes into your shop? I know that you, you know you have tons of them on your site, and you probably deal with a bunch. But yeah, yeah I would say overall, you know, historically, uh, probably the the bird I've, that you do the most of where we live is wood ducks. Um, reason being, they're obviously a very beautiful duck. Uh, it's a duck that's very common. You know, we, we we do get them, and we do get some very 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 pretty ones. You know, what I mean, we we get some very nice wood ducks here. Um, without duck season being on, I've already taken in a number of some, you know, very, very nice birds. So I'd say overall, wood ducks are probably the most popular, uh, that I do the most of. Me personally, um, you know, they're all, you know, they, they all have their, their highs and lows. If I'd have to say my two favorites would be, uh, uh, I, I'm on a nice black duck. <laughs> I'll say, I'm not afraid to say that. I'm on a nice black duck. I love uh, Greater Scop, or another one of my favorites. Um, there's, uh, I'm doing a lot of either. I mean, they're all, uh, they're all fun to do in their own right. You know, they're all, I'm, I'm, that's the beauty thing about them. There's such a variety. But I have to say, wood ducks are probably the most common, and black ducks are probably my favorite. 
So, Tim, when a guy drops a bird off at the at the taxidermist, you know, you hear these stories and you all talk to guys and they'll say, oh, I'm waiting two, three years. My bird's still not done, that kind of stuff. What's a realistic yep. time? What's a realistic time frame? I mean, I know it depends on well, how busy the shop is. Say, but. Yeah, yeah it, it, a lot depends on the shop. I mean, I have birds that are, that are two years. Uh, I, but generally, the ones that I have are two years off are you know, the, 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 the guys have multiple birds, you know, so I may get one done. And then, you know, for the whole project, for the whole project might take two years, but, you know, they get one and then, you know, six months later, I give them another one. And then the, the fourth one, you know, by the time they have the fourth one back, it is two, two years. I have gentlemen that have, uh, God, in the past, you know, I mean, these guys are, they're, they're collectors. They go all over the, all over the world. Um, you know, they may have 14, 15 ducks in there at one time, you know, so, uh, obviously I'm, with being a, a one man shop, um, I can't do them all that fast. Uh, I, I, so a lot of it, the turnaround time, I would say an average turnaround time, I'm going to call it 10 to 12 months. And and that's what uh, I've been telling people this year is 10 to 12 months. I'd like to get it 8 to 10, but 12, 12 or 10 to 12 is uh, is the reasonable amount that when you say, and that's an average, because I do have gentlemen that... Uh, I have birds that were shot here in October that will be done for Christmas. You know, guys say, I really want this for my son. Well, I, I can usually fit one in, you know what I mean? Uh, I have birds that are shipped to me from other parts of the country, and I do a decoy show in Cleveland, Ohio every year. Well, those gentlemen are going to be at that decoy show. So if I know I can get away with not having to ship those birds back, I get them done. So some people get theirs in two months. You know, uh, some people get in the three months, but I'd say generally on average 10 to 12. And I'd say that's a, probably a, a very good industry standard. You know what I would say? I'd say most of the, um, the guys that are, have good businesses and, and generally the, the guy that has a good business, there's only two reasons you'd have it. He's either really good or he's really, really cheap. You know, th- those would be the two reasons why somebody's, has a lot of work, you know. Mm. Um, so, and so I, the thing is, I'd say that that's 10 to 12, and I'd be a little nervous. I mean, I'm not that I'd be nervous, but if a guy could tell you I could have this back in a month, I'm thinking that that's impossible. I can't, it can't dry in a month, you know. Right. So, um, so it, it's, um, you've mentioned this a couple times, and, uh, and I've been wanting to ask. Obviously, people can ship you birds in the mail. Um, you, you've mentioned that a few times. Uh, is there any kind of special process involved with that i mean is it is it an issue to to mail or uh, you know ship a once live animal through the mail and there, there is i mean yeah there, there, there's the obvious you know the obvious uh you know the certain times of year in july you definitely want to go next day uh generally what i use what, what i suggest is i i i personally like you i'm not doing commercial here but i i like ups I, i've always had really good luck with them and fedex is very good too um I usually go, I usually tell guys to go uh, either next day or second day. And a lot depends on the time of year, number one, where it's coming from. Uh, and then the other thing would be how it's, how you're going to, how you're going to wrap it. Now, what I suggest is you, you, you zip lock, you put, put the bird in the, obviously frozen, put it in the two ziplock bags so that it's no way it can leak because they, Obviously, the carriers get a little nervous if there's blood coming through the bottom of the box. I mean, I don't blame them. You know, <laughs> so you want at least two Ziploc bags. Then can you put it into a sturdy cardboard box and insulate the box with uh, a newspaper or that top corner or whatever. Um, and that way there, I would say, you know, you probably want to lean toward next day. Now, if you want to get one of those little coolers, a little styrofoam six-pack cooler or something, and then same deal, zip lock it, insulate it in the in the box. Uh, now that if you put them in the coolers, you know you might get away with second days, but you can save a little money in your shipping, but then you have a little bit more money in your packaging. So it's probably one way is out the other. Uh, a lot of the reasons for the insulation in the box isn't so much insulation as keeping the bird. You don't want the bird banging around in there. You know, uh, you know you want him where he's in there and he's not going anywhere. Uh, and what you want to do is ship on a Monday or Tuesday and obviously notify the tax service that you're sending to tell him, make sure that, you know, he's going to be around there to accept the package and get that bird into the freezer 
ASAP. You know, you don't want it sitting on its back porch for a week. Um, so that's the one thing. I mean, most guys that ship net never get anything that they don't notify me. Right. I think a lot of guys, Some I, I got to imagine some guys don't even consider the fact that they could ship a bird, you know, to the taxidermist. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're kind of looking local and, you know, they may or may not be happy with the choices that they have local. So it's good to know that, yeah. you know, you can look around and send something, um, you know, out of state or, or whatever like that. If, uh, if, if you feel the need. So I think that, yeah, I think that at one time that was, you know, I, I think with the internet, uh, that's less and less the, uh, the norm. I mean, I, everyone, there's some unbelievable websites out there and, uh, uh, a lot of guys are, um, you know, that, that you know, they're, they're kicking them all over the country. I had a tax service from Alabama one time I was on the phone with him. He'd called me to ask me, he'd seen something I had on one of the websites. He asked, called me to ask me how he did it. And he asked me, where's Northeast Pennsylvania? How close is that to you? And he goes, I go 15 miles. And he's laughing. There's a gentleman from Northeast had sent half a dozen ducks to this tax service in Alabama. <laughs> and he's laughing. He goes, why? He goes, I don't understand this. I go, well, I, I, I told him, I've got ducks here that were shot in Texas. <laughs> I mean, it, right. it, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I'm shipping birds to California this year, to Texas, and I could name 10 different tax service in Texas that are every bit as good as I am, <laughs> probably better. Um, but, you know, a guy will get on there and, and he just looks at the website and he sees the way you do things and he likes your uh, your your style, I guess. And uh, they they look at, like, the extra cost for shipping is worth the money. Yeah, you no, know, I think and, it's, and that's, there's a lot to be said for comfort and peace of mind, knowing that you're going to get a quality mount back and, you know, for the money that you're going to invest. So I think a lot of, a lot of the trust is, you know, goes into that relationship, so... Um, yeah. It's something that you probably see clients year after year, you know, repeat clients all the time. I see it as being and having done it now for uh, 45 years and actually as a, as a visitor. So I'm doing the grandchildren of some of the guys that I, I started with. Wow. I mean, you know, I've seen, you know, it, it's just, it's really, uh, it's amazing. You know, I know the fathers, I know the, <laughs> the grandfathers, and now it's the kids, you know, and, uh, and it's gratifying. And, and to be honest with you, that's, websites are a beautiful thing. You know, you can get on there. But basically, any tax I'm sure will all agree with this. There's nothing like good old word of mouth. You know, you do a bird for this guy, and, and he, he likes it, and then his friends get it done. And it, it just, you get the ball rolling. And plus, I do um, I do two or three decoy shows. I generally don't do sports shows. I go to decoy shows. But... Um, Sports shows are a great thing for a guy getting started because you can actually meet the people and talk to the people, you know, and it, uh, it's a lot more personal than a website, that's for sure. Yeah, no no question there. And like I said, Dan and I both mentioned we've seen, you know, your work at the shows, and that's, you know, how we got kind of turned on to having you on the show. We've seen your, your stuff firsthand. So, um, you yeah. know, you, you've given us a ton of great information, and um, I'm really happy that you were able to clarify a couple things, you know, as far as the process and the preparation for us. Um, so I've got I've got one more question for you, and, and we'll let you get out of here on this. Um, so you've been in the business a long time. You know, you've mounted a ton of different ducks and you know, a lot of people, you know, they try to, they, they want to recreate that uniqueness of the bird and, you know, not everybody, you know, wants just the standard type of thing. And there's some really cool, you know, ideas and things that you've got on your website and uh, we'll make sure that we get that information out to our listeners so they can go and check it out uh, and see all the stuff you have. But tell us a little bit or, or share with us maybe your f- most favorite mount that you recall or the, just the coolest thing you've done. And, um, you know, maybe just share a few ideas that guys can consider when, you know, how to display and how to recreate that mount to give it that unique look and, you know, sort of set it apart from maybe some of the other mounts that they've had done in the past. Okay. Well, n- number one, that's the one thing that, that, uh, because as I said, I've, I've had guys, uh, just send me birds, you know, I've had to ship the text like that. A lot of the people that were sending me with, what they're telling me that they like in what I do is they like it simple. I, I do a lot of birds on just a just a two inch thick walnut piece of uh, piece of walnut in a very small plain habitat and just your classic standing duck. And it, it and when I'm doing them, that's not because that's what I like. I mean that's as as boring as that sounds to me. That is 
the best way to do something. Just it, it, I, I follow the keep it simple, stupid rule. You know what I mean? Just keep it plain. Just keep it simple. Do a classic standing mount. Uh, you know, you might want to be preening or something like that. But some of these real elaborate poses, as time goes on, it, it just grows old. Um, now, as for being unique mounts, ones that I've that i really done, that I've really liked, I did a, um, a ring that, uh, it's actually on the website, if you get under the, under the wing, ring that part. Um, a gentleman that I know, his father had carved a ring neck back, back in the 90s at, at a class. And then the grandson, he, he took, well, he took his son to be the grandson. He took him to Louisiana and killed it. Kid shot a very, very nice ring neck duck. So the way we did it was we have this the mounted ring neck swimming up behind the carving. And I actually had to drill holes in the bottom of the carving. It killed me to do it, but I did it. It was something that any anybody who's ever seen that mount just loves it. You know what I mean? I love it. I mean, it's just, it's classic. It's not real crazy. There's not a lot of, they're just a swimming bird. You know, it's not doing a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, and that's basically what, what I like. I like things very, very simple. And, uh, but, uh, but I've done some really wild stuff too. A lot of, a lot of the stuff that guys with, uh, um, some of the King Iders and stuff like that, they can get some pretty elaborate bases in there. You know, when you put the investment in just going to get the bird, uh, the taxonomy is a very small price to pay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I, I, I appreciate the, just the classic look of a, of a nice, you know, um, you know, Drake Mallard or a bull can, uh, some of the stuff that you've got on your website where the, I believe it's the cans that are hanging on the driftwood, uh, you know, on, a lot on the, of those. On yeah, the a, lot, a lot of dead, yeah. I like dead monsters. That that's, uh, I, that, that's something that you can, uh, in some respects, if, if you have the right decor in your home, uh, or if a lot of the guys that do a dead monster, they have such large collections already, and they, but they shoot a couple of nice birds that are going, I gotta do something with it so we get a dead mount. Now, it's funny because, like, in my home, I really don't have anywhere I'd put a dead mount. So, a lot of, a dead mount is something yeah, I think you almost have to write, have to have the right decor for it. But I've been doing a lot of them. I'm telling you, it seems to be very, very popular. Yeah, it's just a, it's just an, it's a, it's a cool look. It's a unique look. Uh, it was definitely something that caught my eye on your website. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about your website. Um, and we're going to, we encourage everyone to go and check you out at, a uh, uh, Tim Schloss taxidermy.com. Uh, we'll post that uh, link on our website. And, uh, when you uh, go to check out the podcast there, you can link over to his stuff. And, uh, if you have any questions or you want to talk to Tim about his services and, uh, uh, and what he might be able to do for you, you can reach Tim at, uh, Tim at Tim Schloss taxidermy.com. And, um, Tim, you know, we're really, we're really happy that you're able to come on the show. And we think that this is a, a really valuable topic that a lot of guys, you know, get a lot of bad information on, or maybe just not the right information. So we're glad that you're able to come on and clarify everything for us. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, now's the, the busy time of year. So you'll be working in the shop and, uh, we won't be having as much opportunity to talk to you because you'll be uh, mounting up all those nice birds that guys are bringing into your shop. Well, so we we that appreciate the, the time. And I would like to get a little duck cutting in too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're entitled to a little bit of that yourself as well. So, uh, uh, sure. well, good luck, good luck with the season. Again, we appreciate the time and we, uh, encourage everybody to check you out at, uh, Tim Schloss Um, Tim, thanks again. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, there you have it. Uh, Tim shed a lot of light on some of the questions we had and, uh, you know, sort of confirmed some of the things that I had thought to be true and then kind of debunked a couple of things that I wasn't sure, some things that I uh, maybe had received some bad information on in the past. So I think it was a worthwhile chat with Tim and uh, we'd encourage everybody to check out Tim com. He's got a, a brand new website that he launched and, um, you know, on there, he actually has a tab that says, uh, you know, things that you should do to prepare your bird uh, to be taken to the taxidermist. So um, definitely a good resource. And I really enjoyed our conversation with him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I I would tell people don't hesitate to to mail your bird of a lifetime to them because I guarantee what you get back, you will be happy with. And on, on that note, too, um, I just wanted to throw another tip out. If you're hunting with a dog, if you're duck hunting or, or whatever kind of hunting you're doing, um, 
and you think that you shot a bird that you want to get mounted, hold that dog back because like he was saying, you know, the feathers, he can fix a lot of things, but if some feathers are pulled out, you can't create the feathers. So that's one thing to, to think about. Maybe you want to go out in the swamp and pick that bird up yourself. So that's just something that I've read over the years. So uh, just throwing it out there. Yeah. Good point. I think, um, you know, that's something that everyone, you know, I, I, we talked to Tim after we, uh, you know, finished the interview and I told him how I'm, I've got a bull can on my, on my target list big time. And, um, you know, if I'm able to take one this year, um, I'm definitely going to be giving him a call and, and seeing what we can do. Cause he's just got some incredible pictures of, uh, canvas back mounts on his website. And I mean, he's got incredible pictures of all kinds of, uh, you know, birds on there, but for me, canvas back, that holds a special place. And that's, uh, I've yet to take a canvas back and, you know, that's definitely on my, uh, my to-do list this year. So, uh, hopefully I get that chance and hopefully I get a chance to call up Timmy and ask him, uh, what we're able to work out with the, uh, with the canvas back. So again, check Tim out, Tim, uh, Schloss taxidermy.com. If you've got questions or want to talk to him directly, you can email him at Tim at Tim Schloss taxidermy.com. So, uh, we want to thank Tim again for uh, joining the show and we'll include all his information on our, uh, on our podcast link on our website. So you can go there to find all the information on Tim. Um, what do you think, Dan, you want to, uh, get into the party shot? Yep. I, I think we had a good show here. Let's do it. All right. This week's party shot is, uh, you know, something that, um, when we were thinking about doing different segments for this show and what we wanted to cover, um, I thought that this week's party shot should be uh, aptly named, uh, success defined. So when I got to thinking about what it means to be successful in the field, I couldn't help but think that most people probably think, you know, what is it? A day's limit, a, 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 you know, a, a full limit, a full strap of birds. Is that what makes a day successful in the field? I'm not so sure. Um, You know, for me, every day that I spend in the blind is a success. Every day is a gift. Um, You know, the sound of whistling wings, you know, enjoying the pursuit of the, of the waterfowl that we all love. Um, I just give thanks every day that I have the opportunity to get out in the field and enjoy God's creation. You know, I think time spent in the field with family and your friends is the most gratifying and satisfying thing that you can do. Um, There's a lot of people that don't get the opportunity to enjoy the outdoors like waterfowl hunters do we get the opportunity to be in the blind early in the morning watching the sunrise and watching god's creation wake up to quote donnie vinson he said you know to experience fantastic things you have to put yourself in fantastic places and i honestly can't think of a more fantastic place than the waterfowl blind on an early morning so for me every day that i get to be in that place is a success That's going to do it for the episode nine of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We want to thank Tim Schloss of Tim Schloss Taxidermy for joining us. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed our discussion on buying shotguns and what to look for when purchasing a new or used shotgun. Uh, you can continue the conversation with us at uh, hpoutdoors.com. Shoot us an in- email at info at hpoutdoors.com. Check us out on iTunes. If you haven't had a chance, please go on and give us a five-star rating and a review. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. And uh, give us a call, 724-609-FOWL. So until next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care.